for a faith that will not shrink. According to Merriam-Webster's dictionary, the first definition for the word strong is having or marked by great physical power. The second definition is having moral or intellectual power. Other definitions are forceful, cogent, and not mild or weak. When we think of someone being strong and having great physical power, the first image that may come to mind is someone who has a muscular physique, such as an Olympic wrestler or an Olympic boxer that is both strong and fast when throwing punches, or an Olympic gymnast who has become muscular from rigorous training regimens. Each of these disciplines, wrestling, boxing, and gymnastics, require daily practice to be successful. Just to get to the Olympics, you must be an elite athlete, the very best in the world. Once at the Olympics, the athletes must then compete in two or three preliminary rounds, a quarterfinal, a semifinal, and then the final competition to compete for a medal. The hours of training that these individuals perform daily, along with a proper diet, can't help but transform their physical bodies. The results of their hard work can be seen. These individuals look fit and muscular. By just looking at these athletes, you can tell they are physically strong. A management consultant, Victor Chang, performed an, an analysis on the number of training hours that it took one of the 2012 Olympic gold medal winning gymnasts to get to that elite level. The gymnast was Jordan Weber, one of the members of the US women's gymnastics team, dubbed the Fierce Five by the media. Jordan Weber was asked the question, when, when did you first start doing gymnastics and how much do you train? Chang wrote that her answer was four years old and about five hours a day for about six days a week from a very early age. At the time, she was 17 years old. The other Olympic athletes had very similar answers. 17 years old minus a four-year starting age equals 13 years of training. She was already a nationally elite athlete at nine years old. So let's assume she trained less as a four to eight-year-old child and only reached the five hours a day level when she reached the elite level at age nine. When you average it all out, let's assume the weight average training time per training day was about four hours. Assume two weeks of vacation a year. That's 50 training weeks a year times six days equals 300 training days. 300 training days times four hours equals 1,200 hours of training per year. 1,200 hours times 13 years equals approximately 15,000 hours. So there you have it. To compete at an elite level, at least for Jordan Weber, it took 15,000 hours of training before the age of 17 to pull it off, unquote. If a disciplined and rigorous training regimen and diet are required to become accomplished in a physical sport, how much attention to spiritual things is needed to develop spiritual muscles, to develop the ripe fruit or characteristics of God's Holy Spirit? This question is asked not to suggest that Christians can earn the crown of life through works but that the development of the fruit or characteristics of God's Holy Spirit is not an easy or passive task, but a strenuous and deliberate one. All of a Christian's time, mental and physical ability and talent is consecrated to God. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, or as was brought out earlier, rational, 
rational service. Once you've seen the plan of God and your invitation, it's not rational not to accept. Clearly understanding this, the Apostle Paul also makes it clear that no one can be justified by the works of the law. Paul writes in Romans 3, 20 to 25, that by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in God's sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Romans 3, 21 to 25. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation or satisfaction in his blood through faith. We are justified by faith in the blood of Christ to be a satisfaction for our sins. Having Christ's merit imputed to us, we can present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. In Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10, Paul says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, that no one should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we are to walk or live in good works. This is consistent with Paul's writing to the Philippian Christians, where he says to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God that worketh in you both to will and do of his good pleasure. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. The Apostle James concurs with the Apostle Paul in James 2, 17 to 26, from the message translation, James 2, 17 to 26. Isn't it obvious that God talk without God acts is outrageous nonsense? I can already hear one of you agreeing by saying, sounds good, you take care of the faith department, I'll handle the works department. Not so fast. You can no more show me your works apart from your faith than I can show you my faith apart from my works. Faith and works. Works and faith fit together hand in glove. Do I hear you professing to believe in the one and only God, but then observe you complacently sitting back as if you had done something wonderful? That's just great. Demons do that but what good does it do them? Use your heads. Do you suppose for a minute that you can cut faith and works in two and not end up with a corpse on your hands? Wasn't our ancestor Abraham made right with God by works when he placed his son Isaac on the sacrificial altar? Isn't it obvious that faith and works are yoked partners, that faith expresses itself in works, that the works are works of faith. The full meaning of believe in the scripture sentence, Abraham believed God and was set right with God, includes his action. It's that mesh of believing and acting that got Abraham named God's friend. Is it not evident that a person is made right with God, not by a barren faith, but by faith fruitful in works? The same with Rahab, the Jericho harlot. Wasn't her action in hiding God's spies and helping them escape that seamless unity of believing and doing what counted with God? The very moment you separate body and spirit, you end up with a corpse. Separate faith and works and you get the same thing, a corpse. The faith within the consecrated Christian the new creature in Christ can't help but be seen by the gracious words spoken and the kind and generous works done in his or her life. The faith that is alive must be exercised. 
It must be active and doing for others. The Christian's inner faith, the substance of things hoped for and evidence of things not seen, is seen on the outside by their words, their works, their service, their giving, their forgiving, their kindnesses, their love, in short, living Christ. Over 29 years ago, Sister Joyce Bateman of the Jersey City class provided a wonderful analogy in a Bible study. She applied faith to a muscle. She said, faith is like a muscle. If you don't use it, faith will atrophy. It will get smaller and grow weaker. But if you use your faith, if you put it to work, just like when you exercise a muscle, it will grow stronger, unquote. Isn't that a beautiful way to visualize the exercise and development of faith? As a muscle growing stronger with use. Faith is so important. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11.6. Faith in God through Christ from a humble heart is the foundation of character development. The Apostle Peter describes this developmental process in 2 Peter 1, 5 to 8. 2 Peter 1, 5 to 8. Applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Elite athletes, if they wish to remain elite athletes, must be very careful about the foods they consume. Gymnasts restrict their diets to fuel the strength needed to perform the difficult gymnastic maneuvers required of an elite gymnast. They must eat the food that will give them the explosive power needed to perform Olympic gymnastics routines. In an Associated Press article titled, What Do Olympic Gymnasts Eat? It says, they eat several times a day, all in small quantities, egg whites for breakfast, a small piece of chicken for lunch, small snacks of cheese and vegetables in between meals, and maybe some fish and fruit for dinner. Gymnastics, unlike swimming or long distance running, is considered an anaerobic sport, one in which short, intense bursts of power are much more important than endurance. Those energy spurts are best provided by a diet high in protein. Most gymnasts try to get between 60% and 70% of their calories from proteins like meats and cheeses, the rest from carbs like whole grain pasta, fruits, vegetables, and fats like oils from peanuts. And as has been proven by all the Atkins, South Beach, and Zone diets so popular these days, high protein regimens help gymnasts keep their weight down, unquote. If elite athletes must restrict their diet to perform at their best, does it follow that Christians must discipline themselves to restrict what they allow their heart and mind to think about and dwell on? The Apostle Paul seems to think so. In Philippians 4, 8, and 9, the Apostle Paul encourages us to think on whatever is true, honorable, right, or just, pure, lovely, of good report, if there is any excellence or anything worthy of praise. Let your mind dwell on these things and the things that the Apostle Paul did and taught. He said to practice these things and the God of peace shall be with you. Have you ever thought that the converse must also be true? We should not think or dwell on things that are dishonorable, false, impure, hateful, evil, or unworthy, nor put them into practice. If we do, we certainly won't have peace from God. 
So we restrict the avenues of thought we allow our minds to travel and dwell on, keeping our mind on things above in order to live a life in spirit and in truth. It's a two-part formula. There is first the truthful, honorable, pure, lovely, of a good report, virtuous, praiseworthy thinking, the theory. Then second, the practical application of this habit of thinking. If we hear of someone doing something honorable, then we should not only think about it, but we should in turn be honorable and try to do something honorable for someone else. The same thought of putting our faith into action is in Romans 15, 1 and 2. Romans 15, 1 and 2. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. The word edification means a structure in architecture and is translated building in other scriptures. Those that are strong in faith are to help their brothers and sisters in Christ to be built up, to be strong. We have the privilege to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ, to visit them, to study the scriptures with them, to sing praises to God with them, to help them with food and clothing. If a brother or sister in Christ is going through a difficult time spiritually, mentally, or physically, pray for them that their faith fail not. Send a card or email a scripture of encouragement. Walk with them in faith through the darkness. Let your light shine with them and help dispel the darkness in whatever they're going through. This is putting our faith into action. We're exercising the spiritual muscles of our faith and our faith can't help but get stronger. By building up our fellow new creatures in the faith, we're built up. It's very much like the concept of muscle memory, but with spiritual muscle. According to Wikipedia, muscle memory is a form of procedural memory that involves consolidating a specific motor task into memory through repetition. When a movement is repeated over time, the brain creates a long-term muscle memory for that task, eventually allowing it to be performed with little to no conscious effort. This process decreases the need for attention and creates maximum efficiency within the motor and memory systems. Muscle memory is found in many everyday activities that become automatic and improve with practice, such as riding a bicycle, driving motor vehicles, playing sports, typing on keyboards, and so forth. Muscle memory has been used to describe the observation that various muscle-related tasks seem to be easier to perform after previous practice, even if the task has not been performed for a while. It is as if the muscles remember. In Hebrews 12.12, 12, we're told to strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble. We are to stand up for the weak when they can't. As we help them get to their spiritual feet, our spiritual legs and backs get stronger. We are to stand up for the weak within our own fellowship and within the household of faith. We are to stand up for the weak amongst the world of mankind as God gives us the opportunity. It would be sin to us if we did not. Jesus stood up for Mary when she poured the expensive spike nard on his head. And some said, it should have been sold and the money given to the poor. And they were scolding her. Jesus stepped in and said, let her alone. Why do you bother her? She has done a good deed to me. For the poor you always have with you. And whenever you wish, you can do them good, but you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for the burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, that also which this woman has done shall be spoken of in memory of her. Mark 14, six to nine. 
When the soldiers and officers of the chief priest came to capture Jesus at night, Jesus protected his disciples as recorded in John 18, eight and nine. Jesus said, if therefore you seek me, let these go their way, that the word might be fulfilled, which he spake of those whom thou hast given me, I lost not one. If or when we do go down the dark streets of despair, self-pity and discouragement, we pray for and develop the habit of thought in Philippians 4, 8 and 9 that will lift our spirits up to the joy of the Lord again. Sometimes the Lord allows us to travel down these dark roads that we can be better equipped to help our brothers and sisters in Christ out of similar pits of despair. Elite athletes discipline themselves to limit the food they eat as well as the type of food they eat to be the most effective at their sport. We must discipline ourselves to restrict what we allow into our minds and what we allow our minds to dwell on so that what we say and do in our daily lives reflects God's love and truth as spiritual lights in a world in spiritual darkness, aptly described by the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 60, verse two, darkness covering the earth and deep darkness, the people. The apostle Paul says to the saints in Ephesus who are faithful in Christ Jesus in Ephesians 5, 8 and 9, Ephesians 5, 8 and 9, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. The source of our strength is God, for God is light. And he has opened our hearts with his wonderful words of life in the Bible and begotten us of his Holy Spirit. The daily bread we eat that sustains us is the word of God that we read, study, and meditate on. Jesus said this when overcoming the adversary's temptation to turn the stones into bread after fasting for 40 days. He quotes Deuteronomy 8.3 in Matthew 4.4. 4. Matthew 4.4. 4. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. We get the same thought about these life-sustaining words when Jesus tells his disciples, the words that he spoke to them are spirit and are life, John 6, 63. The old saying, you are what you eat, is true, both physically and spiritually. Elite athletes know you are what you eat. That's why they restrict their diet so that they have the needed energy and strength for their muscles to move and flex when called upon for the most physically demanding routines required to win the Olympic Games. The followers of Christ are what they eat as well. The more we are filled with God's spirit through the thinking, study, and application of his word, the more we will respond spiritually when faced with injustices, prejudice, or false accusations when standing up for Jesus, for the truth, and for the weak. We will not have the strength to follow Jesus if we live on a spiritual starvation diet. Just like Olympic athletes eat several times a day, we go to the scriptures and pray to be filled and refreshed several times a day. The more we are filled with the spirit of the world and its culture, the more we will respond as the world responds, anger with anger, harsh words with harsh words. We will also not have the strength to stand if our spiritual diet consists of most of the content available on TV, in the news, in newspapers, magazines, or on the internet. In a word, it's junk food. As Brother Paul Malley would say, it's trivia. It's all trivia. He was right. It's trivial. Little to no substance. It doesn't contain the words of eternal life spoken by Jesus. Let's not eat the cake and frosting of the wisdom of this world. The Apostle James describes it in James 3, 14 to 17. 
James 3, 14 to 17. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. The wisdom of this world provides empty spiritual calories. It doesn't contain spiritual nutrients. It does not provide us with the spiritual energy and power of the Holy Spirit to live with all on the altar of sacrifice, a full and unreserved consecration unto death. The Bible is our filter through which the information that presents itself to our minds must pass. Whether it reaches us through the television, radio, smartphone, iPad, or Alexa speaker. This doesn't mean we don't listen to the local or national news. We should be well informed of current events to see God's plan and prophecies being fulfilled. We are very much in this world, but not conforming to its culture. We're fighting against the current of the world's corrupt and immoral culture. We're on opposite trajectories. We're seeking to be transformed by the renewing of our minds through God's Holy Spirit working in us. We're seeking to be holy, to be pure, to be sanctified as our God is holy. The world is moving in the opposite direction towards corruption. Anything goes. Any and all immoral conduct is okay, including altering your state of mind through legalized narcotics. How our day was well described by the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 4. 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 4. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. That's our day. We listen and read critically the news and information that comes our way through the lens of scriptural principles, which enables us to discern objective as well as biased reporting and information between truth and error, between good and evil, especially in relationship to the reporting on the nation of Israel. Most of the reports we receive are biased against Israel. Looking through the lens of the scriptures, we know that God will deliver Israel from the old prejudice of anti-Semitism and false accusations continuing to be laid against Israel. As God says in Zechariah 12, 3, Zechariah 12, 3, and in that day, will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. What does an elite athlete do when he or she fails to win or is injured in the pursuit of their goal of winning an Olympic gold medal? Do they quit? Perhaps some do but most persevere. Here are a couple examples from a Huffington Post article. Carrie Strug was a member of the gold medal winning all around women's gymnastics team that represented the United States at the Atlanta Olympics in 1996. Carrie Strug will long be remembered as the pint-sized dynamo who refused to give up, even in the face of tremendous pain. Strug had been the last gymnast to vault for the United States in the final rotation in the finals of the games. With the U.S. team trailing behind the Russians, a strong performance from Strug was paramount. However, Strug under-rotated the landing of her first attempt and fell, damaging her ankle. Despite her injury, Strug got up and performed the vault again. This time, landing it perfectly. She scored a 9.712, securing the U.S. team's gold medal. 
Strug's courageous performance has remained one of the most memorable moments in the history of the modern Olympics. That took both mental and physical strength in Kerry Strug. Another example of perseverance after multiple failures is the speed skater Dan Jansen, who was the fastest skater in the world, but kept failing to win any Olympic medals. From Wikipedia, in 1988, Jansen became the world sprint champion. Then he was off to the 1988 Winter Olympics, where he was a favorite for the 500 and 1,000 meter races. In the early hours of February 14, the day of the 500 meter event, Jansen was informed that his 27 year old sister, Mrs. Jane Marie Barris, was dying of leukemia. Jansen spoke to her on the phone, but was unable to receive a response. He told her he was going to win for her. A few hours later, Jansen was notified of his sister's death. Jansen went on to compete in the 500 meter race that afternoon, but fell in the first turn. Four days later in the 1000 meter event, he began with record breaking speed, but fell again just past the 800 meter mark. He left the 1988 Olympics with no medals. How devastating that would have been. You know you have the speed and ability, but fail to reach your potential. In the 1992 Winter Olympics in Albertville, he finished fourth in the 500 meters and 26th in the 1000 meters and left the games with no medals. In 1993, Jansen set a world record in the 500 meter event and was cast as a favorite to win the gold medal in the event at the 1994 Winter Olympics in Lillehammer. In the 500 meter event, he ended up finishing eighth. In preparation for the 1000 meter event, his last chance to win a medal, Jansen defied expectations and finished first. He won his first and only Olympic medal of his career while setting a new world record in the process. It was a wonderful moment. You could see the relief and joy on his face. You were happy for him. He had skated to his potential and won the gold medal. In doing so, he kept his word to his sister that had passed away. After the award ceremony, he skated around the track holding his baby daughter in one arm. The child's name was Jane, after his sister. Those athletes that have trained intensely have disciplined their minds and bodies to perform at the highest levels, never stop reaching for the prize. They don't let the injury or previous failures define them. And we should not let our past spiritual injuries and failures define us. Some of the words, well, some of the words from a Christian worship song called history express this thought so well. Letting our past spiritual injuries and failures go. You've been looking back and all you can see is everything you wish you could take back. All your mistakes, a world of regrets, all of those moments you would rather forget. Yesterday is history and history is miles away. So leave it all behind you. You know you can't stay right where you fell. The hardest part is forgiving yourself. But let's take a walk into today and don't let your past get in the way. The Apostle Paul encourages us to do the same, but on a much higher spiritual level in Philippians 3, 12 to 14. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on in order that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. 
I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The Olympics were started in Greece back in the 8th century BC. According to history.com, the first written records of the ancient Olympic Games date to 776 BC, when a cook, when a cook named Koroibus won the only event, a 192 meter foot race called the Stade, the origin of the modern stadium, to become the first Olympic champion. However, it is generally believed that the games had been going on for many years by that time. The Apostle Paul used Olympic sports and the rigorous, the rigorous training of Olympic athletes as a metaphor for spiritual activities and godly service in the narrow way of a Christian's life of sacrifice. This is in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. In 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27, he says, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. And everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I buffet my body and make it my slave, lest possibly after I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. Paul refers to runners racing, running in a race and running to win. We should do the same who seek the crown of life, the divine nature. We should run with determination, endurance, and perseverance. He refers to the competitors exercising self-control in all things. The all things would include daily training, eating the right foods, proper sleep, and sacrificing other activities to be fast enough to be qualified to compete in the race or strong enough to compete in the boxing ring. According to livestrong.com, boxing is one of the most demanding sports and also one of the most dangerous at the Olympics. A boxer needs to be strong, fast, smart, and have the endurance to fight fatigue. If they get tired in the ring, it's game over. The skill of boxing takes countless hours to learn, but that's not the only aspect of training. Fighters have to be fit enough to use the skills they learned through all three of the three minute rounds. The Apostle Paul didn't want to get knocked out in the preliminaries and be disqualified to fight for the crown later in the finals. Paul qualified to fight in the ring, the narrow way of sacrifice, by being justified through faith in the blood of Christ. Paul and each of us are contenders in the spiritual boxing ring who have consecrated our all. The Apostle Paul says he's not just shadow boxing and beating the air. He's fighting his own fallen flesh to knock it out, that he may compete for the divine nature through self-denial, taking up his cross and following Christ. There are times when we do receive punches to our faith through our own fleshly weaknesses, the world's enticements, or the adversary's temptations. But we're not to just lie there on the canvas. We are to look up and call upon the Lord our God, who is mighty to save. Zephaniah 317, mighty to save. It is our God and Father in heaven who gives us the strength to get up and continue the good fight of faith to the end of our lives. For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. Proverbs 24, 16. A contemporary worship song describes this being down and the Lord lifting us up in the following lyrics. I know your heart's been broke again. I know your prayers ain't been answered yet. I know you're feeling like you've got nothing left. Well, lift your head. It ain't over yet. Hold on. Hold on. The Lord ain't finished yet. Hold on. Hold on. He'll get you through this. Hold on. Hold on. These are the promises. 
I never will forget. I never will forget. The great inventor, Thomas Edison, made the following observation about getting back to one's feet. Our greatest weaknesses, or our greatest weakness lies in giving up. The most certain way to succeed is always to try just one more time. On a spiritual level, that's how we're to be in our response to unkind words or false accusations. When falsely accused or disparaging words thrown our way, we respond kindly. We can defend ourselves with the truth, but we're not to respond in kind, but with kindness. The worldly wise might say, why do you respond so gently? Let them have it. Let them know what for. But that's not what our Lord Jesus did. He repeatedly did good to those who would do him harm. The Apostle John records what the Spirit says to the churches in Revelation 2.10. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. We're to be faithful in doing what unto death? We're to be faithful in following Jesus's way of life unto death. That's our part. We know God is faithful to keep his part of our covenant of sacrifice. Jesus showed us what a consecrated life of truth looks like. He showed us the way to be faithful unto death through obedience to God and his righteous principles. He showed us how to give up our own will to do the will of our father in heaven. He opened this new and living narrow way of sacrifice and love for righteousness, which we're privileged to live. Hebrews 12, 1 says, Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. Jesus is the pattern. We do our best to follow the pattern, howbeit very imperfectly as we have the treasure of the Holy Spirit in a fallen human vessel. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. Did Jesus make the most of his time during his three and a half year ministry? If he would be faithful, he had to make the most of his time. Every word and action was thought through. Think about that. Time is very precious and was very precious in Jesus's three and a half year ministry. Jesus knew the prophecies about what the Messiah would do and say. He was the Messiah, the anointed king of Israel. He had to fulfill all those prophecies. There are still more to be fulfilled in his second advent, but he fulfilled all the prophecies pertaining to his first advent. Jesus would have made every moment count. He thought about every deed he did and every word he spoke that they would be done and said according to God's will. Jesus says this in John 8, 28 and 29. John 8, 28 and 29. I do nothing of my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. What are some of the things we can do to grow in faith? How do we cooperate with God to not allow our thinking or our activities to be conformed to this world? This is more of a rhetorical question for each of us, but I would say, Listen to Brother Tom Gilbert's talk from yesterday for this one. How do we cooperate with God to be transformed? The Apostle Paul tells us not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed. So we have a part in the transformation process. It's like God promised Israel to give them the land of Canaan, a land flowing with milk and honey. God did fulfill his promise but the Israelites still had to fight and remove the Canaanites from the land. They were victorious because God was with them in their fight as they exercised faith in God. We are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. How do we do that? Renewing means we change our thinking. We don't respond naturally, we respond spiritually. We respond as Jesus would respond. We respond in a godly way. When you and I respond in a godly way, those steeped in the culture of this world will take notice. That's different. That's holy. May this convention mark the start of something more in each of us today. May it be as though we have just begun to fight. 
Let us stop mixing the spiritual with the earthly and live according to the spirit and only according to the spirit. To be clear, we're not talking about gaining a heavenly reward through works. The divine nature is Jehovah's good and perfect gift to the faithful followers of his son. We are expressing the faith within us by our works. God's Holy Spirit is working in us, and we're cooperating with God to fill our minds with the study and application of his holy word, the renewing of our minds. And we're being transformed that we have a loving, empathetic, and sympathetic heart of compassion for others. To conclude, it is only by God's grace that he has opened the new and living way of life to us through Christ, his son. We've accepted this wonderful privilege and opportunity to be a living sacrifice. Let us keep all on the altar of sacrifice. Have we consecrated half of ourselves, a quarter of our talents, 15% of our mental resources or 10% of our time? No, we weren't begotten of God's Holy Spirit to live according to the spirit in only one of life's avenues but God's Holy Spirit working in us must pervade every avenue of our lives. Just like the gymnast practices rigorously each day, we must exercise the spiritual muscle of faith for our faith to grow stronger. Let us embrace the rigor to fight the good fight of faith. What spiritual adventure does God have for me to live today? How will I live according to the spirit and not according to the flesh? How will I exercise being generous to the ungrateful, kind to the unkind, forgiving to the unforgiving? Will I respond to a harsh word with a harsh word or be like Jesus when he was reviled, he reviled not again, but took it patiently. The spiritual transformation within should be seen in the kind looks from our eyes, the gracious words from our mouths and the good we do. We were begotten of God's spirit for a purpose and a destiny. God didn't bring us to this point in our spiritual lives with our sins and failings to fall on the earth and stay there. We ask forgiveness and for a faith that will not shrink and God graciously reinstates us. He picks us up again, puts the sword of the spirit, his word, the Bible, back in our hands and on our lips reassuring us that he's not finished with us yet. Amen.